So good evening, everyone. My name is Georgia Gallagher, and I am uh, both a retired principal from the TDSB, a secondary panel, uh, but I also am uh, back in an acting role as a centrally assigned principal. And in part, uh, one of my roles is working with Renee, who heads up our TDSB guidance department, uh, working on not only transitions to high school, but also transitions to post-secondary. We acknowledge we are hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. We also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis, and the Inuit peoples. Thank you. So today uh, we've got a, a big agenda, uh, but we are absolutely uh, excited uh, to present this information and help our families in the TDSB. I'm gonna start off with some introductions and from there, Renee is going to introduce our, um, our, our actual presenters for this evening. We will be providing a, a, a OYAP, which is the apprenticeship program update, OCAS, which is our Ontario Colleges Association, OUAC, which oversees university applications. Uh, and then we have some specific panelists that will be spending about five minutes each just talking about some of the things that they're doing at the time of COVID that are different than the usual process. Um, uh, Andrew Gold, who is our uh, one of our new associate directors, he will be joining us later on in the presentation uh, and he will do closing remarks at the end. Um, of course, myself, who I've already uh, introduced myself, and Renee Rawlings, uh, who I've introduced, who is our uh, program coordinator for guidance career development. Uh, so Renee, I'm going to hand it over to you to present uh, some of our guests. So good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, we've, we've met our capacity of 3,000 participants. Um, so that's wonderful. We're also recording this, so it'll be available uh, for others to view a night other than this evening. But up first, I'd like to just welcome all of our guests who are joining us this evening to talk to you about post-secondary during COVID. I'd like to welcome TDSB OYAP, OCAS, Centennial College, George Brown College, Humber College, Seneca College, Ryerson University, the University of Toronto, and York University. I will introduce them individually as they speak, but first we're going to do a few other things before we get to our panelists. First, I'd like to talk about our graduation updates from the Ministry of Education. So in case you didn't know, and I'm sure you know, because you know our grade 12 students went home and told their parents, guardians, families about changes to the graduation requirements for this school year. The first is the literacy requirement has been waived for the 2020-2021 graduates this year. So anyone who's graduating up until August of 2021, their literacy requirement has been waived. Community involvement hours have been reduced from 40 to 20 hours for graduates this year. And we are encouraging students and the ministry is encouraging students to participate in virtual community involvement opportunities. Uh, this could include volunteering um, virtually with seniors, organizing virtual fundraising events, um, particularly um, doing facilitating discussions with newcomer youth virtually. Also any outdoor opportunities, um, where safety and health protocols are able to be in place. We also have some updates with regards to community involvement hours in terms of what's allowable this year compared to previous years. So at the principal's discretion, schools are able to waive the restrictions that do not allow students to earn um, hours during instructional time. So during the school day, there might be something that you do like walking a younger child to or from school, like your sibling, helping your sibling with schoolwork, and that might happen during the school day and that is okay. Also up to a maximum of 10 hours can be uh, used for your community involvement hours um, from paid employment, which was not allowed previously. And of course, these two uh, exceptions are at the discretion of the principal and are important graduation updates so that you know how to meet your 20 community involvement hours. And of course, for the literacy requirement that has been waived. For those of you who have already earned your literacy requirement and your 40 community hours, you're fine. It's just those who might have been in need of those two requirements 
Um, now you know the details. So literacy requirement has been waived for graduates and the community involvement hours have been reduced from 40 to 20. So on that note, I'm going to move on to one of our first guest speakers, uh, Matt Bradley. He is the TDSB OYAP program coordinator and he will be bringing updates with regards to OYAP and what that looks like now during COVID. Hi everyone, I'm just gonna throw a quick presentation up here. So, so the Ontario Youth Apprenticeship Program is a program that is funded by the Ministry of Labor, Training and Skills Development, and it's in every school in Ontario. Um, the first thing I like to just start it off by is just sharing that apprenticeship is post-secondary education, and it often gets sort of uh, passed over when um, parents and guidance counselors and students are talking about post-secondary education in favor of college and university. Um, but it's an amazing opportunity, especially right now during COVID to get, uh, there's a fantastic demand for uh, the careers that um, are, you know, the, at the end of an apprenticeship and uh, right now the demand is really hot like there's so many jobs available for uh, apprenticeship students uh, when they graduate that it's it's quite alarming uh, like right now in 2020 there's a shortage of 1900 or 19 190,000 skilled workers and this is in Canada and the shortage is expected to triple to a staggering uh, 560,000 by 2030. So what, what this is just telling us is that in Canada, there's an incredible demand for skilled tradespeople and the qualification that is required in most situations to become a skilled tradesperson is uh, achieved through the apprenticeship pathway. So uh, it's a great opportunity now and always because these are skills that are in demand. There's a lot of uh, entrepreneurial avenues that can be uh, sort of achieved once you get your skills. Um, one thing that's really important is that skilled trade workers are happier than most workers in Canada. And there's a really good chance of having an above average salary with the possibility of pensions and benefits. Uh, there's a couple of apprenticeship pathways that are, and I'll say right now, um, at the beginning of this year, I wasn't sure what was going to happen, but we've been very lucky. Our partners are all wel welcoming us back with open arms, and we've got really strong numbers in all of our programs. So uh, regular OYAP is when you do cooperative education in one of the skilled trades. Specialized OYAP is where you go to Central Technical School, and you can do that in your last year of high school or as a fifth year. Um, and you would study under the experienced, uh, with an experienced journey person in electrical or plumbing, and then you would go out and do a, a co-op that's supervised by them. That has a really high rate of success in getting students hired. The Accelerated OEAP is a program that is offered to uh, students in grade 11 and 12 that will lead, will actually send you to a college or Union Training Center, where you can get your level one in that program. Uh, and we've got really great opportunities in electrician, plumber, um, carpenter, hairstylist, uh, and some of those are still available for this year even. Step to Construction is a program where you get to try out a whole bunch of different trades Step to tra uh, in construction. And the same thing goes with transportation. That's delivered in partnership with TTC. And our PACE program is uh, something that you get to do exploring a skilled trades with one of the skilled trades people in the TDSB. Um, if you want more information on, on OEAP, we have a brand new website. It's called oeaptdsb.com. You can get my contact information there. You can contact me by email if you have specific questions that I don't make it through uh, to answer in the chat. But um, Apprenticeship, just in closing, is a fantastic pathway that, uh, especially during COVID, where there's a real economic uncertainty with a lot of careers, that uh, has 
amazing opportunities, uh, particularly right now. So this is a very short uh, education pathway where you could be working, you know, right upon graduation and making money while you're learning uh, the skilled trade. So if you have more questions, please reach out and I'll do my best to answer the questions in the chat. Thank you, Matt. I'll move on now to Kelvin Lee, who is the Learner Advisement Lead for OCAS to bring updates from OCAS. Okay, so during COVID, unfortunately the office is closed, but we're located in Guelph. So most people would just mail or send their information in. Um, as long as the power is on, the application service will work. OntarioColleges.ca is our main webpage. And um, it is a brand new, well, not a brand new, it has been uh, reconfigured to apply. The process is much simpler now. You cannot make a mistake because um, once you correct your page, we'll let you advance to the next page. So each page gets saved. The biggest thing about applying is just to make sure you know which program, which school, and the particular program number. Uh, it's just like shopping online. You, you want the right item, the right size, and the right color. So when you're applying to the OntarioCollege.ca, there is a $95 fee. You have up to five choices, three at a particular college. So tonight I will hint three at Humber, three at Seneca, three at Centennial, or three at George Brown. Or you can pick one course, five different colleges, or five different courses and five different colleges. But we ask you to think about just sending in one application because you're only given the college one choice for an offer. Unless you're in the 90% range, it almost guarantees you to get an offer. But depending on your marks, if you really, really want to go to Humber, Centennial, uh, Seneca, or George Brown, you would put three choices of similar programs. Just keep in mind, if you happen to put down music as one choice and engineering is another choice and nursing is another choice, that's three distinctive programs, which makes the offer at those particular schools much harder. So I ask you to take a look at the new how to apply video, which is linked on the OntarioColleges.ca website. It will walk you through the application. Uh, I can't play the video because it's longer than the six minutes that, that were allotted, but uh, applying online at ontariocolleges.ca, you create your own account and please write down your password and your, 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 your hint questions. Other than that, um, I'm sure Humber, Seneca, Centennial, and George Brown will reinforce some of the Ontario College's options. So I will probably answer some questions via typing in the answers. Okay. Thank you, Kelvin. OUAC was not able to join us, but they did share uh, some updates with me. Uh, so I will just read their update for you. OUAC continues to operate, but the building is closed to the public until further notice. OUAC and Ontario universities continue to monitor developments in Canada and globally with regards to the COVID-19 pandemic. For 101 applicants, which are our grade 12 students, Ontario universities recognize that students are going through an unusual school year. Considering the different school scheduling models being implemented this year, the universities will work to be as responsible and flexible as possible with respect to admission processes. Most universities will make conditional offers of admission on a rolling basis using a combination of grade 11 and available grade 12 marks. This type of assessment depends on students being registered in all required grade 12 courses. Please continue to monitor the OUAC and university websites for updates. And there are two frequently asked questions that I thought might be of interest to our grade 12 students and families. The first question that we receive quite a bit uh, that is also on the OUAC website directly in their COVID updates. The first question is, my school changed to the quadmester or octomester system for this year. I will not have midterm grades for some of my courses in April. Will this jeopardize my application? OUAC's answer is, most universities will make conditional offers of admission on a rolling basis 
Using a combination of grade 11 and available grade 12 marks, please contact the university directly for more information. So OUAC strongly suggests that students visit the university's COVID-19 web pages for important admission updates. And these links are included in the OUAC COVID-19 web page. Uh, and as soon as you go in, you'll see that there are COVID-19 FAQs that are available for you um, to review. So those are the updates that were sent from OUAC. Another piece of information that we thought might be of interest to our grade 12 students and families are our transmission deadline dates. These are the dates that our student information system sends over our grade 12 students' marks to OUAC and OCAS. So as you can see, there was a deadline today. There's one on February 15th, one on April 27th. There are our ones in July, the 2nd for OCAS and the 6th for OUAC, the 30th of July and August 31st. This is um, common practice. Every year we have a series of transmission dates that fall at similar times. And so we just thought we would share these dates with you as well. Um, someone asked what's a transmission date. Just to confirm, it's the date that we take all of the information that we have in our student information system. So that's our grade 12 students' marks, midterm marks, courses that they've um, signed up for, uh, and we transfer them over to OCAS or OUAC if, you've, um, if you are applying, so that you're, when you apply and you register for an OUAC account or OCAS account and you go to apply for university or college, you'll see that all of your marks are already there. There's not much that you have to do because we do that at the school board centrally for you. So that's what these dates are. The dates that we make sure that we send all of your information in to the university and the college application centers. And if I can just add, uh, your guidance counselors uh, at the secondary school know all of these dates and they work in conjunction with the vice principal who takes care of all your grade reporting and everything gets in on time. Um, so the reason we wanted you to see these dates is that despite the fact that we're kicking off the application season uh, for post-secondary, um, there is lots and lots of time uh, for all of your courses that you're taking, including things that you might take at night school, virtual school, or over the summer uh, for the universities and the colleges and for OEAP to take a look at uh, before making final decisions. So this is just meant to calm, to bring some calm. There's tons of time. Everything's going to be A-OK. -okay. Yes, and I'll just add to, because uh, I see some questions, should we start to apply for college? Yes, you can most certainly start applying for a college. To apply for Ontario College, the only information that you need is your OEN, which is available on your timetable or any of your previous report cards. And for those of you applying to university, you would get a PIN. Um, this could have been emailed to you, it could have been um, mailed to you, like in the postal mail, it could have been handed to you by your guidance counselor. So if you have any questions around the information that you need to apply to university or college, please speak to your school guidance counselor. I'll take a moment to just say that our guidance counselors in the TDSB are awesome. They do so much to support students. I'm sure that many of our grade 12 students have had some kind of post-secondary information session at their own secondary school and your counselors are connecting with you to provide information. So please be sure to connect with them if you need any additional information after this evening's presentation. If you haven't received your PIN from OUAC, it could be in the mail. Um, you could speak to your guidance counselor about accessing that. And if you are unsure what your OEN is, please talk to your guidance counselor and they can point that out for you. Okay, so we are going to move on to the COVID-19 post-secondary updates. Uh, so we've already heard um, from Matt Bradley for OYAP and from Calvin Lee with regards to OCAS. And of course I shared the OUAC updates that were given to me to share with you. So at this point, we're going to move on to our secondary schools uh, that have so graciously joined us this evening. Now I know that we have grade 12 students who apply to school in Toronto, throughout Ontario, throughout Canada, North America, and all over the world. However, to bring you information today, I thought, let's invite 
our Toronto colleges and our Toronto University, seeing as we are the Toronto District School Board. And uh, the representatives that are here today are awesome. People who show up all the time whenever called upon to do an information session for our Toronto schools. So of course, I've leaned on them again to share some updates with you so that you can see that there are some consistent messages among the schools and slight variations. And of course, if you are interested in a particular university or college, you should connect with that institution directly via their website and speaking to their admission representatives. So without further ado, we'll move on to our panelists. And just so you know, they were given some questions uh, and I'm sure they'll answer more, but the questions that we've heard a lot from families included, with many schools moving to a quadmaster format, what are you using to give students offers of admission? Another question we've had is, what happens to students who did poorly in grade 11 due to COVID and we were out of school? What avenues can they take to still be a competitive applicant this year? And what do classes look like this first year for students in college and university? We knew a lot of students last year who were in grade 12 who graduated and they started their post-secondary during COVID. So what does that look like for them? So I'm going to pass it off to Erin Schoenmecker from Centennial. Uh, who's going to get this party started. Thank you so much, Renee. I really appreciate it. And thank you everybody for uh, attending this evening to get some details. So I'm just going to share my screen quickly here. Um, so I kept my presentation in line with some of the questions. If you do want more information about Centennial College and the over 300 different programs that we offer, I'm going to throw some links to our virtual open house webpage, uh, as well as at the webinars that we host through our website on a regular basis in the chat once I'm done. So if you want some more specific Centennial College program related information, you can certainly find that there. But what I'm going to focus on this evening is going to be um, 2021 updates and in those updates what I'm going to talk about is what admissions looks like for fall of 2021, how we're tackling course delivery during COVID, how we're tackling practical lab delivery, uh, and then uh, some information about tuition and fees. And I have a very short video from our uh, engineering department that really kind of encompasses what online and hybrid learning looks like at Centennial College. So we're going to cover some of those key areas. Feel free to ask any questions that you like and I'll answer them once I'm done presenting. So when it comes to admissions, uh, the process is the same. So all the transmission dates are gonna be the same like uh, Ms. Rollins was, was speaking about. Uh, so for Centennial specifically, what we're going to be doing is staggering our offers of admission. Uh, what that means is typically the deadline is February 1st for equal consideration applications. So that's the most important part. So when the question was asked with regards to what can students do um, to really kind of uh, give themselves the best foot forward when applying, it would be make sure that your application for Ontario colleges is processed before February 1st, because that date isn't going to change. Uh, now, that being said, we understand that with the quadmaster format, we might get grades a little bit later, um, and we might not see some of those numbers uh, as early as we typically would to be able to send out offers on February 1st, because that is the date that we do tend to start sending offers out. And this is more directly related to our uh, overly subscribed programs or the really, really competitive programs, things like nursing, paramedics, pre-service fire, uh, for Centennial specifically, some of our aviation-based programs, to keep everything fair, because we do know that not every student is going to have those grades that they're going to, uh, to need um, into the system at that particular point in time. We encourage you to apply by February 1st. We're going to go back to your grade 11 grades. Um, so unfortunately, if you weren't too happy with those grades, there isn't much that we can do by way of going back and improving those grades. But do apply by February 1st. We'll be issuing conditional offers of acceptance, and then we're going to wait until we get those final grades to firm up those particular offers. So you can accept an offer, and then it's going to be contingent that you do complete those classes. So you do have to be registered in the prerequisite classes that are necessary for acceptance for that particular program. But we are going to be staggering those offers. So we're not going to be sending out a big blast. It's not going to be just first come, first serve. Um, it's going to be, you know, just kind of gauging each individual application. This is going to delay a lot of offers of admissions, especially for highly competitive programs or oversubscribed programs. So just be patient with us as we sift through them. We're trying to make sure that everything is going to be fair based on that quadmester format. So, so we give everybody the best foot forward. When it comes to course delivery during COVID, uh, delivery is going to be subject to change based on the status of this particular pandemic and then the corresponding guidelines provided by public health. But that being said, we were very, very quick to flip all of our programs into an online delivery and actually launch some uh, over 30 dedicated online programs that are just absolutely impeccable. And you will be learning 
from home or from wherever, if it's your residence room, if you're deciding to, to go to residence, um, you will be learning digitally in that particular format. And some programs are going to have a bit of a hybrid delivery. And that's essentially going to mean um, if, you, if your program requires practical lab time, you will still get that practical lab time. But what we'll do is we're, we're going to phase it in and we're only going to be allowed to have certain number of students in those labs at a particular time. Um, with that being said, it's a little bit of a scheduling nightmare, but please bear with us. In the previous terms, what we were able to do uh, at the onset of COVID was we were able to table the lab delivery until the end of the semester, and then we actually scheduled a lot of those students to come in. So they did their first uh, portion of their education with the online component, and then we were able to stagger in the lab delivery. So for those students that are looking at engineering, those students that are looking at things like automotive, where it's mandated that you have to have lab time or aviation, we, we were able to meet ministry requirements at the onset onset of COVID to get some of those students graduated with the essential time that they needed. And that is going to continue as we move forward. Um, and we're going to make sure that you get that practical lab time that Centennial College is so well known for uh, with regards to that. Um, and then as far as practical lab delivery, how are we going to be delivering these labs specifically with regards to COVID and, and some of the different um, uh, rules and regulations that we have to follow. So obviously limited uh, number of students on campus. We are actually limiting the number of staff on campus. So if staff do not have to be there, then we are asking them to stay home and work remotely so we can free up some of that space and ensure that there's distancing and ensure that we are able to meet all those particular regulations from the ministry just to free up space uh, on campus. And then the number of students that are permitted per lab is going to be dictated to us. Uh, we're just getting some information on that now that uh, Toronto has moved into a different uh, zone when it comes to COVID. So we are getting some of that information now. and We will be making adjustments on the fly as those different rules and regulations not change, but as they're made and they're articulated to us. So uh, only programs that absolutely require an in-lab component for graduation will be permitted to come on campus. And we've got an extensive screening process. We do require students to take uh, an online quiz and then check in um, and then fill out a screening um, form on an app on our Centennial College app so we know who's on campus, when they're on campus, if we do need to go back and we do need to contact trace to, uh, to identify anybody that may or may not have been exposed in a negative situation. When it comes to tuition and fees, the tuition is going to remain the same, but where we are going to make some concessions is going to be the ancillary fees. So we will be removing certain fees and adjusting certain fees, um, and that's been done to reflect the, the goods and services that students are going to have access to. So you won't be paying full fees for things like the athletics facilities or the, the facilities that are available on site if you're not actually utilizing them. A really nice thing that, uh, that I personally appreciate as a staff at Centennial College is that during COVID, we aren't charging for parking as well. So if you do have to come on campus, you will not have to be paying for parking while you're there. You're going to get an opportunity to just park on campus. All the gates are open. It's not going to be at, as at much of that much of a premium to get a parking space while you're on site. And just for a little bit of uh, information's sake, uh, I'm providing you guys with a breakdown of how we kind of handled the fees for this particular semester. So this fall, um, and you can see the modified fee. So the fee reduction, what the original fee was, so some, as you can see, we're actually breaking right down to zero. Um, so for social events, things like building operations, obviously you're not using the building, so why would we charge you for that? Um, the athletics and wellness center fees, graduation and convocation, the student center buildings. So the only fees that will be remaining is your student ID card because that is still in place and you still will be able to use that and you will be issued a student ID card, but we've, we've reduced it by $15. So that's a pretty significant reduction because you won't be getting the physical card right away. The technology um, fee for software licensing and emailing has been significantly reduced by $66. So the fee you'll be paying is $18.65. And that's essentially just to make sure that you still have access to your student email and a lot of that software that you'll be able to download for either a reduced cost or no cost as a Centennial College student. And then the athletics and wellness levy is going to be uh, lowered down to $12 because they still are offering a lot of different fitness classes uh, in the virtual space that are absolutely free for students to take part in. Um, so you can jump in and you can stay fit while you're working from home. I know that that's a big concern for myself. The, the, the extra COVID weight that I've been putting on sitting at my desks at home really close to my refrigerator. So I've got this really quick video and then I'm going to wrap up and this is uh, it is about our School of Engineering and Technology, but it is a very, very good example of what online and hybrid learning looks like uh, for all of the programs that we do offer. So if you just bear with me for one second here. There we go. The world is changing 
And at Centennial College, we've risen to the challenge to adapt our education and change with it. We have made the shift to offer a number of our programs in a completely online format, delivering the quality education you've grown to expect from us in a flexible, convenient way. The way of the future. We've always prided ourselves in our hands-on learning experiences, what we believe has always set us apart as an institution. When it comes to online delivery, compromising on value was not an option. Our engineering technology and applied science faculty have been working diligently to develop our virtual labs, course videos that go in-depth on the information you need to be successful in your career. Unlike our in-class model, online offers you the benefit of being able to watch and re-watch course content so you can excel once you're in the workforce. We're utilizing cutting-edge technology to offer simulation software, replicating an in-lab experience anytime, anywhere. Digital classrooms allow for engaging conversation and collaboration, just like you would in a physical class setting with learners from around the world. With the clear benefit of online learning, in addition to our fully online programs, we have made the move to offer hybrid programs as well. Students receive the best of both worlds, an in-class hands-on experience in our labs and remote access to virtualization software, plus recordings of our laboratory activities. Get ready to thrive in a dynamic virtual learning environment, continuing to prove our position as leaders in engineering technology and applied science. Get ready for everything Centennial College, delivered right to your fingertips. Centennial Online, you belong here. Thank you, Aaron, for that presentation. We'll move on to Robin Papoff from George Brown College. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Aaron, that was great. Wonderful. I'm just going to start um, sharing my screen now. So just momentarily, let me get this up and running. Here we go. That's what I want. Okay. Sorry. Don't, don't, don't look at my actual mess of a desktop. <laughs> it's always so embarrassing when I do that. Uh, so yes, I am Robin. I am from George Brown. Uh, thank you so much for all coming tonight. Uh, this has been incredibly informative um, and I hope you're all learning a lot too. Um, I just want to say first off is that Aaron did a really excellent job of, um, of pointing out everything to do with admissions because uh, we haven't, George Brown is doing pretty much the same thing in that we are going to be, you know, doing the conditional offers based on the quad masters um, and delaying um, all of our admissions offers. So it's not all going to roll out right away. There's going to be nothing coming out on February 1st, which is normally what it would be. Um, and there are going to be delays, but I feel like everybody's just kind of used to delaying things at the moment. So I hope you can all be patient with us as we are patient with everybody right now. So thank you so much. And we will get offers out as soon as we can. Uh, so yes, um, we know that we do generally look to grade 11 grades. Um, and so if you, like Aaron said, if you didn't have the best grade 11 marks, unfortunately, we can't go back in time and change them. So just really focus on doing well in these grade 12 quads that you're in right now. Uh, you've got lots of time to, not lots of time, but you've got time to focus. You're at home. So put all your efforts into those grade 12 marks so they can get where they need to be. So we can get you into the program that you want. Um, in terms of George Brown and what we're doing uh, in response to COVID, um, pretty much, you know, the same thing that we're all doing is we want to do the best for everybody. Um, so yes, uh, of course, we're going to follow um, all of the suggestions by the ministry. We have all sorts of protocols in place for our students and faculty and employees who are coming onto campus who are, are of course, minimal. So like Aaron said, uh, we want to keep, you know, the attendance on campus as low as absolutely possible. Uh, only the people who need to be there are there and they are gonna go through the protocol, whether, you know, so temperature taking, uh, we're, we're noting who's on there so we can do uh, tracing if necessary. Um, and so, and we're gonna keep focusing on the quality of education that we're giving because we want you all to, um, you know, we want our students to succeed and we wanna give the best education as possible even in this new format, we can, you know, we're, 
you know, we're working, you know, and, you know, we're just flipping as much as we can and as fast as we can. And we feel we're still giving up the exact same quality of, um, of um, sort of education, that's the word I was looking for, as we would have before. Uh, so we're doing our very best and we think it's pretty great. Uh, so of course we're committed to online learning. So we're doing that combination of synchronous, so real-time learning, and then we're doing asynchronous as well. So there is some portions that are pre-recorded um, and we use a combination of Blackboard, Microsoft Teams, as well as Zoom. Um, our students are, you know, are interacting and they're talking to their faculty, they're doing group work together, everything that, you know, they would do, we're just doing it online now. Uh, and uh, they're doing really well, they're excelling at it. So that's wonderful to know. Um, and so <laughs> an interesting one is, uh, so for our culinary students, what we actually have started doing is they, they actually receive a box of, you know, ingredients at home and they're going to go online and they're going to watch a lesson and they are going to cook at home and they're going to produce that beautiful meal. Uh, so they still get that hands-on learning. There are some portions of lab work for culinary and for other programs as well, of course, that have to be done in lab on campus. And that's where we are. Same thing, we're shuffling our scheduling, we're, minim we're minimizing numbers, whatever we can do to keep it as absolutely safe as possible. I do know somebody is actually doing our culinary program through Con Ed and they're having the greatest time cooking at home with all these beautiful ingredients. Uh, so while that's not full time, we are doing exactly what we can to give that quality education. Uh, so uh, while you know we can't be on campus, we want to give students as much of you know as much of the on campus experience as possible. Uh, so we have you know as many services as we can going. Uh, so a really important one we found, of course, is counseling. So for our students who are coming in specifically for first year, especially, um, you know, maybe they're overwhelmed, you know, we all know about, you know, screen fatigue is a very, very real thing. COVID, pandemic fatigue, whatever we want to call it, those are real things. We're exhausted, a lot of us. It's hard. This is not an easy time. So we, of course, have our uh, counselors online doing video chats, phone calls, whatever it is, they, the students still have access to them so they can talk to somebody if they need to. Um, of course, we're still offering tutoring for students who are struggling in any way. We have our library supports available to our, all of our students. So for students, especially students who came in in first year and they don't know how to utilize and do research for things like um, researching uh, medical journals and things like that, our, our library is still running all kinds of supports uh, so our students can access them. And then we still do have things going on through Student Life. Uh, so they're running all kinds of fun Zoom events that happen. They have movie nights, things like that. So no, it's not typical, uh, but you know we're giving our students a great experience. Uh, so uh, while uh, we do have you know these modules that we run online, so students have to take a five module set, uh, so they get a basis for online learning, so they know what they're doing because this is new to everyone. So this is for returning students, for first year students, whatever it is they do have to come in and do these five modules. Uh, you know, they run through the different platforms, so they get familiar with them, they get that hands-on experience, and they know what they're doing so come first day of classes, they're ready to go. Um, and of course, we wanna be as transparent as absolutely possible. Uh, so all of our information is posted on our website. We have a specific code COVID-19 um, page, so everybody can go on there, see what's going on, both for, you know, students. Our applicants can check out what's going on, so uh, they don't have any questions. They're not lost in the wind or anything like that. Uh, I do think that's time for me. Uh, so I'm going to stop now. I don't want to take up anybody else, uh, but I'll be, I'll jump into that Q&A and answer a few questions and I'll be happy to help. Thank you everybody so much. And thank you, Ms. Rollins for putting this all together for us. Thank you, Robin, appreciate that. I'll pass it on now to Imelda Christian from Humber College. Hi everyone. My name is Mel and I'm a recruitment officer at Humber. So I'm gonna share my screen. I'm super excited to be here today. Give me one moment. Awesome. Okay. So I've been asked to, to prepare a specific presentation with regards uh, to how, the, how Humber has actually prepared itself to face COVID. So um, in terms of admissions, 
there are minimal changes for applicants, particularly who do not meet the admission requirements of the program, especially if they've applied to a diploma or an advanced diploma program. We do actually offer mature student testing, which is comprised of both English and math. This is available for applicants who are over the age of 19 who have not received a high school diploma. We do continue to assess applicants based on the admission requirements on the, the um, program website. So I do tend to advise students and parents to check out the different requirements you know, needed, the different credits, for instance, uh, for each specific program. Because sometimes in addition to those admission requirements, what they need is perhaps a portfolio or an interview or any additional requirements uh, that uh, you know, needs them to book uh, testing, for instance, through their My Humber account. Um, with many schools moving towards a quad master format, what marks are you using to give students offers of admissions? So we uh, once again assess applicants based on the stated admission requirements of each program and we will provide conditional acceptance using the final grade uh, 11 and interim, interim or midterm grade 12 grades. Now, what happens to students who do not do as well uh, in grade 11? So the admissions manager has communicated and mentioned that uh, to ensure that applicants are successful at college, they, it's really important for them to have the foundational skills and knowledge. And if a student didn't do as well, as anticipated, they could retake the course or complete the course requirements either through ILC to make sure that they have the knowledge and skills necessary and grades to meet the requirements. Once again, this is case by case and we generally, my role at Humber as a recruitment officer is to meet with students and some parents on a one-on-one -on -one virtual advising or phone advising, whatever they prefer, and really to investigate and dig deep as to what the student's career goals are what they're hoping to do, what they're hoping to achieve, and having a deeper conversation that's personalized to them. Um, and then we continue the conversation by referring them to the admissions advisor. So in terms of what the first year experience or what the first year classes will look like, super, super popular question across the board. We have a website like Robin and Aaron mentioned, um, and ours is called humber.ca forward slash updates forward slash. And you can see like um, at, you know, any given time, different updates pertaining to, you know, whether classes are going to be online or hybrid delivery, right? And what is important to know. And one of the things I recommend to students is to save this as a bookmark on a computer so they can check it out. For instance, once again, a lot of parents, concerned parents and students call in and say, oh, will all the classes be online? And as you heard from my colleagues, both Erin and Robin, not necessarily so, because some classes have an, a lab component, right? They have to have hours in a lab to gain their practical work experience, for instance. And this is just a snapshot of some that I took, for instance, uh, behavioral science, the bachelor's, you can see for it's online uh, for winter semester biotechnology. You can see a hybrid delivery and broadcast television and videography is basically a hybrid delivery as well. So really, once again, check out humber.ca for slash updates for the latest information. And if you would like to schedule an appointment or chat with us or send us an email, we are definitely you know available. We work from 8.30 to 5, uh, from Monday to Friday, and we can be reached at student.recruitment at humber.ca. If you have admission specific questions, I see a lot of Q&A posted um, that are asking for admission specific courses, you can definitely email admissions at humber.ca. Thank you so much for your time. Have a lovely day. Thank you, Mel. I'll pass it over now to Kevin Richardson. If, uh, just before Kevin uh, starts, uh, just to, wanted to again answer some bulk questions because they're coming up frequently and it has to do with grade 11 marks and whether or not that's going to be used or, or grade 12 marks going to be used. So typically uh, the, the qualification for the programs come from the grade 12 marks and uh, that is you know also the case this year uh, but as is always the case when there are very competitive programs um, and things are pretty close in terms of the applications um, the universities do take a look back at the grade 
11 marks as well. Uh, so th there's always a little bit of a combination. Uh, so it's not ever exclusively uh, grade 11. It's the grade 12 prerequisite course that uh, the universities and the colleges are looking for, but they do take into consideration uh, those grade 11 marks. So again, because a lot of uh, questions were that, I'm not gonna answer them individually in the q and I'm gonna pass it back to Renee. Thank you. And I also just wanna reiterate, please, that of course, you can always talk to your school guidance counselor. I, they have a lot of information and a lot of answers to your questions and you can speak to them directly. So please um, be sure to connect with your guidance counselor if you have additional questions that aren't able to be answered this evening. But I will pass it over now to Kevin Richardson from Seneca College. Hi, thank you. And thank you everybody for attending this amazing event. I'm just going to share my screen. Give me one second. Um, whoops. And I want to bring up. So uh, my name is Kevin from Seneca College. And uh, I just wanted to bring up our website because we're going to show you a few places on our website where you can really find a lot of the information you're looking for. And even as it gets updated, you can always check it out down the line and, and see what, what the new updates are. Right off the bat, I wanted to talk about the admissions questions that were being discussed. And then I know the other colleges have already pretty much given answers that are very similar to what we're doing at Seneca College. With admissions, we are still processing all the applications we receive, obviously up until February 1st and then beyond. But February 1st is that equal consideration date. We will be basing conditional offers on the marks we have received to date. So what that means is if we do get marks from the first quad, we will look at those. We will still offer the conditional offers and then you will still have to meet all the additional requirements needed for that program, whichever one you're applying to. And of course we will look at, for some of those oversubscribed programs, as Georgia mentioned, we will look at those grade level marks quite possibly. Unfortunately, if your grade level marks weren't that great, they are what they are. We can't change those, as Robin mentioned. Uh, so we have to go based on the marks that we have been supplied from the, from the school. So that's just how those things were kind of going to play out. Um, so I hope that helps a little bit in that regard. Um, we do have, I saw a lot of questions about scholarships. So I just wanted to mention, we do have many, many scholarship opportunities at Seneca College for all of our programs, our diploma certificates, and as well as our degrees. We do have automatic scholarships for our degrees. So just to bear that in mind, if you come in with an AD average and above, there's a thousand dollars automatically for you. So there's a lot of scholarship options out there for you. With regards to our classrooms and how classes are being presented right now uh, with the COVID challenge, Obviously, most of you are probably looking towards September. I can't say for sure how our classes will look in September because that decision hasn't been made yet definitively. Currently, we are doing the online classes and some in-class um, hybrid formats to get all of our, our lab sessions in for our current students. And that continues to move forward for this winter, hopefully into the summertime when we get more and more students into the labs. Safety is the biggest concern at Seneca College for the staff and the students. And I can tell you, nobody's on campus who isn't supposed to be there. Uh, all of the staff who can do their jobs from home are doing them from home to allow more safety for all of our students and the professors and students um, staff on campus to deliver those, those types of labs. And there's all kinds of new innovative lab, virtual labs happening with our nursing degree program. They have a new virtual lab set up um, coming to our students where they will actually be able to put on the VR goggles and do some simulations in an actual virtual lab setting, which is pretty amazing. So these things are all taking place and progressing and you know it's really changing the way we're gonna be delivering programs in the future. So it'll give us so many more options. Uh, as our president said today in a, in a discussion, it's allowed us to jump ahead much further uh, quicker than we, um, we thought we needed to or had to with the COVID situation. So lots of opportunities there. Right here on our website, I just want to show you. So this is just psychicolis.ca. This is our main site. Right up here at the top of our website is where you can get the information about, our, um, about COVID and what's going on. So sorry, I just got a little, the screen's in my way here. <laughs> um, why can't I click on that guy? Anyway, um, but there is right, in, right up here, there is a COVID-19 um, 
updated site for all of our students and our staff and for anyone looking at Seneca. And that's where you can go to get the best information, the newest information with regards to what's happening and what's going on uh, with Seneca College and COVID and all the different updates. Some of the neat things we've also done is I know people sometimes are concerned about, well, what if I don't have very good internet access? What if uh, my laptop or my computer at home isn't very, isn't, uh, doesn't have all the power it requires for the program I might be taking. So Seneca has taken a lot of steps to help alleviate these with our students, um, reaching out to them, offering different types of services. We've even got a contract with Dell so students can, if they have to and need to or looking to, can purchase new laptops at discounted prices from Dell at various levels um, to meet the various demands of their individual programs. But another neat thing we've done is we've offered for all of our students, they have access to our main computers at our Seneca campuses. So what they can do is they kind of virtually log in through that to that computer and they can use that computer's power and software and just mimics on their laptop at home. So if they don't have everything, if they don't have the power from their home computer to access everything they need, they can basically sneak into our computers from our main campus virtually and just mimic it on their laptops at home so that they can have the power they need to do everything they need. Um, but they just use our Seneca servers and our Seneca computers from home. Uh, so that's another awesome advantage that's happening there. And right here on our website, COVID-19 pandemic, when you click on this, give it one second, this is where all the updates come in. As you can see, just last, just last Friday, it was updated with the new information as far as what's going on, facts for students, for employees, for everybody. So this is where you can go to really, if you're looking, um, a month or two from now, you want to see what's going on, what, what's happening, that's where you can find all that information out, as well as find out, you know, our class is being offered in a hybrid or online version come September. Uh, as far as the fees go, yes, the fees are still, they are what they are, they're not really being reduced as far as the tuition component goes, but Aaron really talked about it nicely when he was talking about the ancillary fees and those are being adjusted and some of them you can opt out of as well. Um, but many of the options are still being offered at Seneca. Many of the, like pretty much all the services and everything, it's still being offered to students just being done virtually. And so I want you to understand when students are coming to Seneca, they're still gonna have access to all the services and all the wonderful things that we do to help them as their students then they get to really give them all the support they could possibly need and all that stuff is still in play and that's still being offered at Seneca College so they have those wonderful opportunities so you can check that out and just to end it here if you do want to learn anything more about Seneca um, virtual campus tour this visit us button right here is a great um, great tool to use you click on that and as you can see we have all kinds of webinars coming up advising sessions you can book you can book virtual tours but they're live virtual tours and different things like that so if you're looking to get more information about Seneca please check out the website senecacollege.ca if you have any questions feel free to put Seneca in the Q&A and then I can look at those and answer thank you so much everybody and have a great night thank you Kevin uh, and just to uh, pause for a second I think we had some questions around um, the deadlines for university and college so just uh, as a reminder, the Ontario college deadline is February 1st and the Ontario university deadline is January 15th, okay? And I put that in the Q&A for people. In addition, there were questions around fees and I've also added the links to find out what your fees are for um, OUAC and OCAS uh, so, and the details around that because I think there were questions around payments as well. But we'll move on now to um, Sue Ann Uth, the Assistant Director of Student Recruitment at Ryerson University. And I believe Sue Ann, you're being joined by Erica Danziger, who's going to be helping with some questions as well. That's right. Um, I'll just be a moment while I share my screen. Okay, excellent. Hello, everybody. Um, and um, it is lovely to see so many people here supporting your families and your so many families here supporting um, your children in their decision to attend university and joining us today. I'm very impressed with the turnout um, and definitely appreciate being part of this discussion. Um, my name is uh, Sue and Ut, and um, I am here with my colleague Erica Danziger, who is part of um, our admissions team here. Um, and we're excited to be answering questions that you have related to the experience of students at Ryerson. 
Um, I will be covering a, a few um, tidbits about what's happening on our campus and as well covering information about what's new at Ryerson as well. Um, and um, just an introduction to the university itself. Ryerson is a large comprehensive university with over 80, uh, um, with over 60 undergraduate programs. We have over 45,000 undergraduate and a graduate students um, studying primarily remotely. Ryerson's um, connections span globally with over 215,000 alumni worldwide, as well as research centers, institutes, and labs. Unique to Ryerson is zone learning, a model of experiential learning for Ryerson students to, um, for Ryerson students that provides internships, mentorship, funding space um, for ideas to develop up, incubate and grow into startups meant to transform ideas into solutions with a social and economic impact. We have 20 zone, oh, sorry, we have 10 zones on campus, 10 uh, as well as zone startups globally um, in countries such as Vietnam, South Africa, just to name a few. And our very first zone, the DMZ is currently ranked number one business incubator um, in the world by the University Business Index. We are continuing to grow our campus footprint and um, have opened a new Daphne Cockwell Health Science Complex last year, which includes 18 floors of resident space, lecture and class space, as well as research facilities, the Ryerson Creative, Techno um, Ryerson Creative Technology Lab. We are also accepting applications this year for a brand new program in the Bachelors of Fine Arts Professional Music. This one of a kind program will develop creativity and business savviness for careers in music production, entertainment and entrepreneurship. Our Faculty of Arts um, has, is now offering double majors um, to its program offerings. And we are also starting to roll out co-op for our arts programs. Now I mentioned some of the programs already, but we also, um, but our programs all reside in our six undergraduate faculties, the Faculty of Arts, Community Services, Communication and Design, as well as our Faculty of Engineering and Architectural Science, our Faculty of Science and the Ted Rogers School of Management. So many programs for students to select from. We offer both unique programs in areas such as graphic communications management, creative industries, arts and contemporary studies, our humanities program with a unique set of courses, ideas that shape the world, which allows students to be co-taught by multiple professors in one course. We also offer a number of professional programs at the undergraduate level. Erica is here with me, graduated from one of our professional undergraduate programs, urban and regional planning. Some of these additional um, professional programs include our nursing collaborative program, uh, public health, occupational health and safety, architectural science, just to name a few. Um, and true to Ryerson's history, we continue to offer experiential learning. Now our uh, our experiential learning opportunities could look like internships, co-op, field placements, clinical placements. And while Ryerson University continues to follow public health recommendations and guidelines, our courses are primarily remote. Um, however, we do continue to expand experiential learning and students who are attending this year are still gaining um, the experiences, many of the experiences that they can expect. Um, being on campus. So for example, our first year science students have augmented reality enhanced science labs, which enable these students to beam home lab materials for their experiments. In September, our Ted Rogers School of Hospitality and Tourism Management hosted guest speakers during World Tourism Day to focus on women in tourism, tourism innovation and empowerment, as well as recovery and innovations. And the Ted Rogers School of Management has a 92% co-op placement rate this fall. So we are continuing to offer exceptional student experiences to students. And these experiential learning opportunities are built into our program curriculum. 
Now our programs um, have, we have two types of programs when it comes to admissions. We have grades only programs and grades plus programs. Grades only programs means that we are assessing students based on your their top six grade 12 UNM courses. And this may include prerequisites, but we're looking at the top six best courses uh, for the overall average for admission, as well as for scholarships. We also have grades plus programs. And these programs require something in addition to, um, to grades, and that would include a portfolio interview or audition. Um, just a quick note that, um, that when students are applying, we are looking, um, students are able to apply for three programs. And when it comes to quadmesters and grade 11 results, we are um, similar to the note from the OUAC, we, the implementation of quadmesters and the cancellation of final exams will have no bearing on our assessment for admission. We are looking at um, the grades that we have at the time of assessment. Um, we are seeing a number of questions about the grade 11 courses and recognize that concern. And um, for students who performed, um, had weak performance in grade 11 results, these will not impact an application. We are looking at grade 11 results only to benefit the student. Um, we also, um, have a number of scholarships and awards for students, including prestigious scholarships and many opportunities for students to stay connected with us. Thank you. Uh, so we'll move on to uh, Lydia Gill, the Recruitment Officer, Equity, Outreach and Support for the University of Toronto, who's joined with by Marika Remmel, the Assistant University Registrar and Director of Admissions for the University of Toronto. Good evening, everyone. I'm just sort of getting set up here. Um, I just want to thank everyone uh, so much for coming out tonight. Um, as Dr. Rollins said, uh, my name is Lydia Gill, uh, and I'm the Recruitment Officer uh, for Equity Outreach and Support at the University of Toronto. Um, joining me today is my amazing colleague, um, Marika Remmel, um, and I will allow Marika to introduce uh, herself. So feel free to go ahead, uh, Marika. Okay, I will start. Thank you. Uh, Marika Remmel, I'm the Assistant University Registrar and Director of Undergraduate Admissions at the University of Toronto. And I don't know, Lydia, if you wanted to share the uh, You Together screen before I roll in or up to you. Definitely. So I just want to again want to thank everyone for coming out this evening. Um, and I really want to thank Dr. Rollins for having us out today. Um, but just before we get started and we get into all of your questions, um, I really wanted to speak a little bit about the impacts of COVID-19 um, and the ways in which the University of Toronto has really been supporting our community um, and the broader society um, throughout this process. So um, at U of T, really our staff, students and faculty have really come together and been really relentlessly creative uh, throughout the challenges posed by COVID-19. Um, we've poured almost over $6 million into emergency grants for students who needed or who maybe needed a a laptop or a device last minute, or even to student, or even as far as students needing um, support with living expenses during the pandemic. Um, and that's above and beyond our $90 million that we continue to disperse each year um, in financial assistance. So, um, and, it, and that's just in regards to financial supports, ensuring that our students were able to continue their education um, throughout this, uh, the COVID pandemic, um, and ensuring that that transition to online learning um, was supported financially. Now, in addition to that, our students um, and faculty are working on a number of other areas supporting um, the COVID-19 um, um, response. Um, some examples would be we have students have that have devised new um, ventilators. We have faculty that are researching and developing new therapies. And our students are leading the way with amazing PPE drives and fundraisers across the GTA. Um, and those, those are just some of the examples and the ways in which we're not only supporting our current students throughout this transition, um, but more importantly, how we're trying to support our communities across the GTA. Now we will head into our questions that were posed by the TDSB and parents, and I will allow uh, America to take that away. I'll read the question to America and I'll have America respond to the question. So our first question was, with many schools moving to a quadmester format, what marks are you using to give students offers of admission? So even before I answer that question, I want to say first off that we recognize that we are all in this together, working our way through very uncertain times. And universities and colleges are all responding to changing conditions. 
just like secondary schools and students themselves are. But ultimately, we all want the same things. To ensure the students interested in post-secondary studies can prepare as they need to, that they can be assessed fairly for admission when academic information may be reported to us differently or at different times than in the past, and that students ultimately have the tools that they need to make good decisions for themselves and be positioned to succeed in their post-secondary choices. So this slide shows um, the way we make admission decisions. It's not a change from our regular admissions policy. The University of Toronto has traditionally made conditional offers of admission on a combination of grade 11 and grade 12 marks earlier in the cycle and on a full grade 12 in the May round. The only difference this year is that we will not receive grades for courses taken in the fourth quadmester until July, which will be too late for us to consider for admission to most programs and most faculties. This year, students may not have six grade 12 marks even reported for consideration in the May round and may not have grade 12 marks in all of the prerequisite subjects at that time. The question we've encountered most frequently has to do with calculus. What if that's being taken in the fourth quadmester and it's a prerequisite for you? We will have a grade 11 mark earlier in the year in math. And in later rounds, we should have a mark in advanced functions. So in the absence of a calculus mark, if students aren't taking that until the fourth quadmester, we would consider grade 11 math earlier in the year and the MHF for advanced functions later as predictive of calculus, even in the May round of admissions. The second question had to do with so our second question for today is, what happens to students uh, who did poorly in grade 11 due to COVID-19? What avenues uh, can they take to still be competitive applicants this year? We do look at a full academic record. Oh, just lost my notes. And would uh, generally expect to see relatively consistent apologize, I'm just going back to my notes, but expect to see relatively consistent performance throughout grade 11 and grade 12. We know that most students would have had a normal first semester in grade 11 last year. If the second semester was weak, yet other evidence of grades suggests that that performance was an outlier, then we would take that into account. And again, I want to reiterate that we're looking for enough evidence of academic strength to admit students and to be confident that they can succeed. We're not coming from a position of looking for reasons to deny admission. And I think that's a significant takeaway for everybody. If a student has significantly underperformed in grade 11 uh, and that course isn't being taken in grade 12 until the fourth quadmester, um, then the student might want to discuss that situation with their guidance counselor to see what other options there are for perhaps taking that course earlier than the fourth quadmester, but do rely on the guidance that the guidance office at your schools can provide. If the weak performance was related to COVID-19 in the sense that perhaps the student had the virus and experienced complications, they could complete and submit a request for special consideration. And this is also an option for those students who in some other way experienced extraordinary or compelling personal health or financial circumstances or who wish to identify a disability. And the third question. And our last question is regarding what does what do our classes actually look like for first year students, uh, given the challenges with COVID-19. Again, not very different, I think, from what the other institutions have responded, but the majority of our lecture style courses are being delivered online, synchronously or asynchronously. Some lab sections have taken place in person, however, given the recent lockdown, of course, we've made changes. And again, all in-person instruction is aligned with Toronto and Peel public health guidelines. 
There has been, as again, other institutions have indicated, considerable innovation and adaptiveness on the part of faculty to promote learning and engagement in this new online environment. And we're glad to hear by and large that students are reporting that the experience for them is better than they thought it would be. Thank you so much for that, Marika. Um, and so I'll let now you take it away. Awesome, thank you. So now we're going to move into just a few more slides. Uh, Dr. Rollins, I do see that you turned your camera on, so I know that our, our time is running short. Um, I do want to touch on a few areas where I think many students have questions around how do I apply to U of T. So I do want to remind everyone that at U of T, we are one university with three campuses, and we are home to seven academic faculties um, that students can apply to directly from high school. Um, so in regards to these seven undergraduate faculties, that would be U of T Mississauga, U of T Scarborough, plus five, five faculties at the St. George campus. Um, so that would be the Faculty of Applied Science and Engineering, Daniels Architecture, Landscape and Design, the Faculty of Kinesiology uh, and Physical Education, the Faculty of Music, and then of course our largest faculty, which is the Faculty of Arts and Science. So I want to just sort of impress upon everyone, when you are selecting your choices on the OUA seat, you can apply to um, all of the, you can apply to any of the highlighted areas on the screen once, up to a maximum of three times at the University of Toronto altogether. So I do want to keep that in mind. So it's once per faculty up to a maximum of three times at U of T altogether. Um, new this year, I do want to highlight for any applicants to computer science or Rotman Commerce uh, admissions categories in the Faculty of Arts and Science, at the St. George campus will have the option of selecting a second admissions category for consideration. This option will be available on your Join U of T portal when the university receives your application. So I'm just going to keep things rolling because I do realize I'm running short on time. But um, we do have uh, this here is a list of all of the programs at U of T that will require a supplementary application. I wanted to put this up here because we do offer over 700 undergraduate uh, program options. There's a whole lot of options. And for the vast majority of our programs, we are just looking at your grades for consideration. But the only exceptions would be the programs on this list where they actually do require a supplemental application. So just keep that in mind. If you're applying to any of these programs, there will be a second step, another part to your application that you will need to submit um, after you've submitted your OUAC application. Um, so this is a little bit of an overview for your full timeline um, in regards to what does your year actually look like at U of T. The one key thing I want to highlight here is that our decisions will normally be probably be pushed back till maybe January. We won't start releasing offers, offers and offers of admission until maybe our January slash February rounds, and that will then run right through until May. Um, so again, for any student that's concerned about grade 11 finals, just keep in mind that we will continue to consider you as we continue to receive more of your grade 12 grades. Last, last, uh, last slide. Um, I do see everyone turning their screens on. Um, so we do offer um, quite a bit in regards to financial assistance at the University of Toronto. There are a number of ways that you can access those funds. I would just sort of like to quickly wrap up and say that um, we, off, we do have a new booklet that we actually published called Financing Your U of T Education. I will put the link to that PDF in the chat for all of you that are looking for how can you finance your U of T education. I encourage you to look there. Um, and lastly, we have our Applying 101 event, and I'm going to put the registration in the chat for that um, as it is coming up this Saturday. Um, and it's actually where we are going to walk students step by step through the U of T app to the application, the OUAC and the U of T application. So in regards to first the OUAC and your join U of T portal. So if you are applying to the University of Toronto, I highly encourage you to attend this um, presentation on Saturday, as it will walk you through all of those steps with screenshots and you'll be able to see what the entire process looks like. That brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you all so much for attending and thank you to America um, for joining us today. Um, and we are so grateful to be here. Thank you to uh, Mrs. Gallagher and to Dr. Rollins. Thank you, Lydia, Lydia and thank you, America. So I'll uh, quickly, I think, um, Georgia, yeah, did you have something you I guess I'm just gonna do a quick little, uh, consolidation of some questions. Lots of questions about gap years. Uh, and so I just want to wrap them all up. It, gap year is a, is a very personal decision. And there is there are pros and cons to taking either path. But one of the key questions that keeps coming up, should I apply and then defer? Or should I just wait and apply later? Um, 
I think you need to bring into your circle, your family, uh, your trusted teachers or guidance counselor at school that will help guide you. And also you need to make sure that you understand whether or not the program you're applying for will allow for a deferral because some will not. And so you need to do your research, get onto those uh, university college websites and try to figure out, you know, is this even a, a possibility? Okay, thank you. Um, and last but certainly not least is Marlon Gold, the Senior Undergraduate Recruitment Specialist from York University to bring us updates from York and what York is doing during COVID. Marlon? Great, hey, thanks so much for having, I think we're last, so a little uh, last but not uh, least, which is, uh, which is always a good way to, uh, to end the night. Um, so hopefully you can see my screen uh, now. And just to, um, yeah, thanks everyone for, for coming out today. It's such a fantastic um, a, a event and such a great way to, uh, to stay in contact with everyone. So um, for those of you that already know something about York or for those of you that might be uh, new, to the, uh, new to the university, um, we do have two campuses located uh, in the city of Toronto. We have a new campus coming online uh, in a few years in Markham. So our Keele campus is located in the north part of the city. It's one of the largest campuses in Canada home to about 50,000 students and it has everything you could ever need to live in, learn, um, hundreds and thousands of classrooms, uh, our own shopping mall, about 100 different places to eat. Uh, and it's a fully isolated campus in the city of Toronto, which means when you're there, you really get to experience the kind of true university feel that if you kind of close your eyes and imagine what university looks like to you, after all the TV and movies that you've watched, um, it, really, it really looks like York University. Um, every person you run into um, it's York every building you go into is part of York we only have one road that goes around the outside of campus no traffic lights um, no tall office towers um, you really get in a, in a lot of ways the best of both worlds you get to um, live in residence or live at home or live in the, in the GTA um, but when you're at York you get that kind of true university experience um, at either one of our campuses we also have our Glendon campus that's located more in Midtown Toronto, down the street from um, Drake's new place on the Bridal Path. Um, it's the smaller home of, uh, of our two campuses, home to only about 2,600 students. Uh, definitely has a reputation of being the French campus of York University. Um, most students don't speak French that go to go there. Um, it's, uh, you have to have a passion for languages. You will graduate with a bilingual degree, but beautiful campus, lots of great uh, leadership training and uh, really great options if you want to study liberal arts and science programs uh, in a beautiful setting um, while picking up some uh, some languages on the side. As far as COVID goes, and that's what we're kind of all here to, um, to go, I like to break it down into three phases, as you will, which kind of relates to how it all kind of panned out for us. So phase one was March 2020, um, right around just before March break, um, both campuses closed um, for uh, officially 48 hours. We kind of locked everything down. For students that were living in residence, uh, we were one of the only universities that allowed people to stay. We didn't kick people out if they had nowhere else to go. We encouraged people to go home but if they needed a place to stay, we allowed them to stay. Um, any PPE or ventilators that we had, so um, some of our programs like nursing and health programs, uh, for instance, had um, those you know, coveted N95 masks and ventilators. Those were immediately donated um, into uh, Toronto Public Health and the hospitals. Um, we also purchased masks for every single one of our students. So everyone got uh, masks that they can be safe and um, if they were coming to campus for whatever reason, but pretty much everything um, moved away, which was which is a pretty remarkable feat if you think about it. Um, and just to kind of reassure everyone, because um, I know we've been talking a lot about online stuff, and I know um, a lot of you are in high school and you're taking online courses now, or you've seen in the news, um, at least for York, it's a much, it has been a much better experience than what you're seeing in the news and potentially what you're um, experiencing. Uh, we've been offering online classes for uh, years, if, if not decades. Um, this is a, is a new feat in terms of this many courses. We offer 5,000 courses every single year at York University, um, but we have the support, we have the infrastructure, we have the platforms to offer really, really um, vibrant and dynamic um, and robust classes that often mirror what you would have um, in class. The biggest complaint from the majority of our students is that classes are actually too engaging and go too long. Um, so where a new class would, would, you know, the new kids would start walking in uh, when, the, when the class was finished uh, for the next class um, in a virtual space 
you don't have those kind of same time restrictions. So sometimes collages go a little bit long. Um, for those that didn't have any technology or, or access to technology, um, we purchased laptops. The initial batch was about 1,500. Uh, we've then purchased thousands more. This is for students, for staff, for faculty. Um, those are professors. Um, so anyone who needed access to technology, we made sure that they had it with no cost right in their hand um, so that no one was without. Um, all of our services, 100% of our staff, no one got laid off. Everything is still being offered. Um, the buildings are closed, but the university still very much remained um, open. And we had record enrollment for our summer semester, which is fantastic for the university. Um, during the spring, we updated every single one of our classes. So when students were enrolling, you knew exactly what you were enrolling into, whether the course was going to be online, synchronous, or asynchronous, or a combination of the two, a blended uh, course where you were going to do some in-class and some out-of-class, or a fully in-class. There were very few courses that were offered on campus, and only the specific components that had to be offered on campus were. So 98% of courses were offered remotely for the fall and winter. And we did announce before September even started that our winter courses, the ones that will be starting in January, were going to be online. And that was really reassuring for students to know. We had a commitment to all of our students that if you started a course online, um, you can finish it online. So if you're, you come to York and you start a course, um, and then the miracle of vaccine scene comes and all of a sudden things go back to um, quote unquote normal, um, you won't all of a sudden be forced to get to campus every single day, at least not until um, the following semester. When September did roll around, um, we pivoted all of our courses online. Um, we supported all of our new students. And that's a really important thing to still allow them to get a frosh week, still allow them to join clubs and uh, make the most of their university experience because we know how exciting it's supposed to be. Um, if students need to live in residence, we allow them to. Um, some in-class courses remained and we've in implemented physical changes. So hand sanitizers, um, barriers, whenever we do return ca to campus, those things will be in place. In terms of applying, deadline is January 15th, and we encourage students to apply as early as possible so that they're not doing it at the last minute. Um, we always use the grades on file, similar to the other universities and colleges. We do three main rounds of offers, the first being in December, January, primarily based on grade 11 grades that have already been completed. February, usually a combination of grade 12 uh, finals from quad one and quad two, as well as grade 11 grades that have already been completed. April, at that point, we're pretty much solely using grade 12 grades, and we'll continue to make qualified students as long as space permits. If we're missing a grade 12, we use we always have to have English and we always have to have a prerequisite if there is one required in your program. So we will use the grade 11 grade if we don't have it. For most students, that really is a benefit. Most students, um, especially with the um, uh, no grades can fall in second semester of last year. That benefits most students and our scholarship program will remain the same. And those are for any students that has an average above 80% and the higher grades are, um, the more money, uh, the more money there is for you. Uh, in terms of moving forward, um, obviously every decision like every university and college that's spoken today, it's based on safety and it's based on recommendations of governments and public health officials. Um, it's not just a decision that we make um, alone. Um, as I mentioned, any course that you start online can finish online and it's all about constant communication. So we communicate with our students um, and we encourage you to take advantage of um, all the things that we have to offer. Um, centrally uh, in kind of our recruitment and admissions office as well as all of our faculties we have 11 faculties at the university several hundred programs and there's lots of information sessions that first uh, website um, futurestudents.yorku.ca slash events is really your one-stop shop to learn about everything that's happening in the university over the course of the next year my email is there if you have any questions or concerns please do email me um, and as well we're doing a draw for free tuition so anyone that wants more information um, i know that people have been putting in the questions up how do you get more information um, if you go to that website, uh, which is under my email address, um, you can sign up there and you'll have an opportunity to um, learn more about York, um, both for COVID and just for general program information. So I'll wrap up there. I'll put this information in the chat just so everyone has uh, quick and easy access to it. And thanks again for everyone for organizing this event. Thanks for including us. And uh, we look forward to supporting you now and uh, into the future as you become university students, hopefully. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Marlon. Um, so I'm looking at the time and noticing some of the questions that we have, and I just want to, so a couple of questions asked about grade 11 marks, and is there any way you can avoid um, the universities or colleges from seeing your grade 11 marks? And the answer is no, your grade 11 and 12 marks all show up on your transcript and they are um, transmitted. 
uh, through OUAC and OCAS. And as you heard from all the universities and colleges, uh, particularly this year, they are looking at grade 11 marks to uh, offer you admissions. But many said that they will not penalize you for the grade 11 marks and will wait when possible for grade 12 marks. Um, so that was one of the questions that showed up quite a bit. Um, and I, and I, there's another question just about uh, scholarships. If you go to Scholarship Canada, uh, that is a really good uh, website that will allow you to take a look at a variety of different types of scholarships. Some are academic merit, others are leadership, some are financial need. Um, and that's always a good starting point uh, for your journey uh, in terms of financing post-secondary. And I just want to reiterate, because I'm looking and there are a lot of very specific questions. And so I will suggest two things. One is to contact the post-secondary institution for which you have a specific question around their school or their program, because they'll be the best ones suited to answer your questions. But before even doing that, again, I'd like to reiterate, please go to your guidance counselor, your high school guidance counselor. All of the information that we shared today, generic information that we shared to get today, would be shared with you through your high school guidance counselor. I know that they work really hard to put together post-secondary events and to share post-secondary information. And so they would be able to answer most all of the questions that you've posted today. And so given the time, uh, I would leave you with that charge to connect with your high school guidance counselor for any questions that you feel were not answered this evening. I would also encourage you to go to the websites that we've suggested, both in the communication that went out to families and that we suggested today, and that many of the colleges and universities have posted in the chat. And as I mentioned at the onset of this presentation, uh, you should also go directly to the post-secondary institution, particularly those that are throughout Ontario, throughout Canada, and throughout the world, if you have very specific questions around programs that you would like um, to apply to and the admissions process for those particular schools. At this point, I'd like to pass it over to Andrew Gold, our Associate Director, who I believe would like to bring some closing remarks before we end this evening. Uh, thanks very much, Renee. Uh, first, uh, let me start by saying that uh, earlier in my career, I was a high school teacher and a high school vice principal and a principal. And I certainly remember how important this time in our students' lives and their families, how important this time is and what I've never had to experience is uh, supporting students during a pandemic as they move from high school to next steps. And so I want to uh, tell you that our commitment as a school board is to find new and innovative ways, given the times we're in, to reach out and connect to our families. That doesn't happen magically. It happens because of a very committed, brilliant, and amazing staff. And I do want to thank Renee Rollins, who leads our central guidance department, and Georgia Gallagher, who's returned as a central principal uh, to assist with uh, this work. Um, many of our central staff were redeployed to schools to keep class sizes smaller. So aside from doing this work in a creative and brilliant way, they're doing it with a very, very small team for a school board that has uh, over 200,000 students. And so on behalf of all of us, I want to thank them. And I want to thank our guests from the from OCAS and from the various colleges and universities. We're lucky to live in a city that has so many people that care about our young students, our graduating students. And we thank you for giving of your time this evening to work in partnership with us to support families. We're going to continue to look for ways to support um, the pandemic doesn't have a lot of positive attributes, but if I could pick one, it's that we're going to find new ways to do things with and for our families, and this is an example of such things. So thank you for everyone for attending tonight.